Hello all. Uh, in this presentation, I want to introduce the attorney-client privilege. Uh, and I want to do that by way of comparing it to the broader ethical uh, obligation of confidentiality. And then after that introduction, I want to discuss the rationale for the privilege. Uh, and then finally, I want to start our uh, discussion of the precondition to prerequisites for invoking the privilege, covering the first two of those prerequisites here. Lawyers are supposed to keep their clients' secrets. We see this in movies and on television. This is just a basic part of the image of a lawyer, and it does define something really distinctive about this professional service. Lawyers are supposed to keep their clients' secrets. Now, this takes two different forms for lawyers. First of all, there is the broader duty of confidentiality embodied in Model Rule 1.6, and we'll be talking about that broader obligation later. It covers any kind of information that the lawyer uh, receives through whatever mechanism that is relevant to the client's uh, representation. Uh, now, within that broader uh, duty of confidentiality, there's a subset of, of that duty that focuses specifically on the attorney-client privilege, and it's an evidentiary privilege, meaning that if a court says, we want you, attorney, to talk about this thing about your client, if the client invokes it or if the attorney invokes it on behalf of the client, you can say, no, I can't talk about that because that's privileged. And that privilege overcomes the, uh, the request from the court for your information, unless there's some specific exception that we'll talk about later. So if you think of the, uh, if you think of the whole zone of confidentiality or confidential information as being this uh, large circle, uh, then there's a subset of that, this smaller circle, that would be the privilege. And uh, what happens within that privilege zone is protected more strongly than what, is, than what happens in the larger confidentiality zone. Within this privileged zone, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the attorney can refuse to cooperate or can refuse to turn over uh, information uh, requested in an informal setting, even if requested by a court. On the other hand, uh, if you're talking about information that's not privileged but still within the larger circle of confidentiality, uh, the attorney cannot volunteer that information, but if a lawful demand for that information arrives, then the confidentiality obligation gives way to the, uh, to the lawful demand. So, for instance, if a discovery request from litigation arrives and it deals with something related on that, or that can be classified only as confidential information but not privileged information, uh, then the attorney would be obliged to uh, comply with the, you know, with the uh, lawful demand for that information. Now I want to talk with you about a famous example of the attorney-client privilege at work. Uh, it involves the attorneys for a, uh, a truly creepy mass murderer, Robert Garrow, this guy here, uh, and his attorneys, uh, Frank Armani and Francis Belgi, uh, working. They are licensed in New York, and that's where all the events uh, take place. And uh, this is a canonical case. This case is to professional responsibility what Miranda versus Arizona is to criminal procedure. It's the case that, uh, that uh, people think about when you're thinking about questions involving the attorney-client privilege. So here's the story. Uh, these attorneys, Armani and Belgi, are... Um, are appointed in a murder case uh, to represent Robert Garrow. Uh, they sit down with him in their office and say, so tell us what's going on. Tell us what you know about this. And he says, well, I've committed, yeah, I committed this murder and I also committed several other murders and some rapes. And by the way, a couple of these murders, they've never found the bodies. They, you know, the young women are missing and people suspect the worst, but they don't really know. I can tell you where the bodies are. And so they say, yeah, well, I 
guess we need to know about this. Tell us where the bodies are. So he tells them. They go to the location where the bodies are hidden. Sure enough, there they are. So these attorneys, Armani and Belgi, uh, take pictures of the, uh, of the crime scene. Uh, they do make one mistake in doing this. They move the arm of one of the bodies so that it will fit within the picture frame. Uh, but otherwise, they don't disturb the scene. They just take pictures and then leave and tell nobody. Uh, meanwhile, uh, plea neg negotiations start up in the one murder charge that, that where they represent him, and they go to the prosecutors and say, you know, we could help you solve a couple of other murders if you would be willing to uh, plea, you know, negotiate a, a favorable guilty plea with our client in uh, this case, or we can make it a package deal. And the prosecutor uh, refuses. Ultimately, uh, they, the bodies are found. It's discovered that the attorneys knew about it, and both criminal charges uh, for ta body tampering uh, as well as ethics charges are filed against these attorneys. The criminal charges go away pretty uh, quickly. Uh, the mens rea was just not there under the, North, under the, uh, the New York statutes. Uh, and the ethics charges go away. In fact, the New York State Bar issued a report confirming the propriety of Belgi's conduct, except they said he shouldn't have moved the limb of the dismembered body. Um, uh, so the bar says, you know, you did the right thing here. It is difficult to commend lawyers in this situation, but you followed the rules and this is operating the way we think it should. And it was a difficult situation. We recognize that. Uh, in the aftermath of this uh, event, both attorneys, Belgi and Armani, lost clients hand over fist. People wanted nothing to do with them in this small uh, city. Uh, they lost employees. People no longer wanted to work for the uh, for these attorneys. Belgi ended up retiring and going to St. Croix. A Molotov cocktail was left in Armani's backyard. That is an improvised explosive. Uh, and his wife and daughter were harassed by obscene phone calls. And so there were some real, you know, personal costs involved for these attorneys in following the, uh, the requirements of the privilege here. Do we have here uh, a proper invocation of the attorney-client privilege? I think yes, and we could step through the elements as laid out, uh, really a summary of the common law position laid out in the Restatement of the Law Governing Lawyers, Section 68. Your casebook uses uh, the same basic elements from a 2010 draft of Federal Rule of Evidence 502B, but let's go with the common law version here. It's the same material and actually good law now as opposed to the perspective status of the uh, 2010 draft of the evidence rule. So was there a communication here? Uh, yeah, we have uh, we have Garrow sitting in the office saying to the attorneys, you know, here's what I've done, and uh, they learn about it as they're talking. So it happens during a communication rather than, say, Armani and Belgi just stumbling into some, you know, witnessing something visually. Uh, was it made between privileged persons? Yeah, in this case, I'm just picturing Robert Garrow sitting in the office with Frank Armani and Francis Belgi. You could also have other people sitting in there who would be agents of either of either the client or the lawyer if that person is necessary for the communication to happen. Uh, so as long as it's only between privileged persons, is it in confidence? So, you know, figuratively or literally speaking, is the door closed? You know, is he in the office speaking to them and they've made some effort to, you know, reasonable efforts to keep it only between those privileged uh, persons? Uh, and he hasn't gone out later and, uh, you know, Gara hasn't gone out later and shared that same information with uh, other people. So he's made the communication in confidence. Uh, and then did he do it with the purpose of obtaining uh, legal assistance? Or if you are the attorney, if you give your, if you say your piece with the purpose of providing legal assistance to the, uh, to the client? Um, so it appears that all of those uh, prerequisites are present here for invoking the attorney-client privilege uh, in Garrow's case.
By the way, in another famous twist of events, Garrow escaped from detention. Along the way, he had gone, gotten crossways with Armani and had threatened to do harm to Armani's uh, daughter if he ever got out. So once he got out, Armani said, well, maybe now's the time for me to cooperate with the police and gave them some ideas about places where uh, Garrow might be found, you know, based on what Garrow had told him about his past efforts to, you know, escape from the police. Uh, this car here is the... Um, the car that uh, that Garrow used to escape, uh, he at one point parked it and covered it in brush, and so there's a great uh, chase scene uh, involved in the uh, uh, in the case. Uh, at any rate, this uh, this coda on the events is interesting for our purposes because it flags that there are now some exceptions to the privilege uh, again the uh, the attorney-client privilege. Uh, and in particular, uh, they revolve ar around clients who are trying to uh, commit crimes or frauds. And we'll talk a little bit later about those uh, exceptions. But for now, uh, just flag for you that this story invokes an interesting set of potential um, uh, exceptions to the attorney-client privilege once Garrow got out and was threatening a crime. So in the case of Armani and Belgi, we don't just say to them, the law doesn't just say to them, you're allowed to keep this secret. The law says to them, you must keep this secret. It's a good thing. We applaud you. It's difficult and people are not going to understand, but we applaud you for doing this. So why do we expect lawyers to keep this privileged information secret? Uh, the idea is that it promotes a more uh, more candor in the relationship between client and attorney, uh, a more trusting relationship, and that uh, it's not just a benefit to the client, but creates social benefits as well. At least this is what uh, we have said through the work of people like John, uh, Dean Wigmore, one of the leading evidence scholars over the last, uh, you know, more than a century. Uh, and one of the leading uh, advocates for the, a very strong version of the attorney-client privilege. At any rate, we say that uh, once an attorney knows more about the client's situation, then the attorney can give better advice and better convince the, uh, convince the client that it's time for you to comply with the law. Uh, it also says that uh, once I know, once as the attorney, I know more about your case, uh, then I can be a better zealous advocate for you uh, in court, and that uh, benefits the overall operation of the justice system to have uh, zealous uh, presentation of the fully informed best positions of all the uh, all the parties. Uh, along a similar line, once the attorney knows. Uh, what the um, what the facts are according to the client, then you don't have to speculate and say, well, if it's fact A, then legal claim A, and if it's fact B, then legal claim B. You know, once you know from the client, then you can winnow out your legal arguments and present the ones that really only fit the facts as you understand them from your client. And then finally, the idea is that if the uh, the client is more trusting of the attorney uh, and is not trying to decide which facts to withhold from the attorney to get what you want, the, the client can focus more on, uh, on controlling the objectives of the representation. This promotes client autonomy. What's the case against the attorney-client privilege? Um, one part of that case was famously uh, dreamed up by Jeremy Bentham, who we see pictured here, uh, in his Rationale of Judicial Evidence from 1827. Uh, Bentham, uh, the, uh, the utilitarian philosopher, says, what I'm interested in is a set of rules that create the most happy for, happiness for the largest number of people, the greatest social happiness. He's a classic utilitarian uh, moral philosopher. So he says, if we were to abolish this privilege, that would be really good because the guilty client and the innocent client uh, will behave differently. The guilty client will come in and will know, 
anything I say to this lawyer could come out against me and so won't say much, won't be very cooperative. Therefore, the guilty clients will get less good representation. More of them will be convicted. Good for society, he says. On the other hand, if you really are innocent, you know that, you come into your lawyer, you tell them everything because, it, you know, anything that you tell the lawyer, if even if it's turned over to the authorities, it's only going to help you. Uh, and so there's, uh, you know, there's a different impact for the guilty and the innocent. Now, one might ask, do clients really know whether they're guilty or innocent? Sometimes it may be true that clients think they're guilty, but there's a perfectly valid legal defense or vice versa. Maybe a client thinks that he or she is innocent, but they misunderstand the nature of the defense. So we're, Bentham may not really be appreciating uh, uh, the power of lawyers to sort out for clients the strength of their defenses. But anyway, that's a famous historical uh, critique of the, uh, of the privilege. Another uh, line of objection to the uh, privilege, and I think a more plausible one, uh, concedes that there are good things that come from the privilege. Yes, it's a good thing that clients have some candid relationship with their lawyer and it's a good thing that lawyers can give advice based on the full truth but this good thing comes at a cost and that cost is the truth that is once the lawyer knows about it it might be truthful relevant information but they they cannot bring it into the tribunal the, the privilege prevents them from testifying about this uh, and so this cost may be too much in some situations that may particularly be true if you ask, do you really need the strongest version of attorney-client privilege to promote a trusting, uh, candid relationship between clients and attorneys? After all, people have gone out and studied this uh, and have found that even with these very uh, uh, close to absolute rules for the attorney-client privilege, lawyers sometimes don't really tell their clients much about confidentiality. And so the clients, if they never hear about confidentiality, do they really rely on it as, as they're talking with their attorneys? Uh, the clients themselves, whether or not they're told, you know, if you ask them, did you know about this confidentiality stuff? A lot of them say, oh, no, I didn't know about that. Or others say, yeah, I knew about that, but, uh, you know, I didn't really take it that seriously. I you know, I either don't believe them or it just wasn't rele relevant to me for some reason. And another pretty profound point here is that if you look around the world, uh, the United States uh, version of the attorney-client privilege is much stronger and much closer to, to absolute form than what you find in most other places. In most countries around the world, there may be some privilege along these lines, but it is more easily displaced. It is more easily outbalanced or outweighed uh, by competing obligations. We do some of that in the U.S., but less than in, uh, than in other countries. Uh, and so if they can get along and their attorney-client relationships are functional, then perhaps that's an indication that ours would be too. But at any rate, we do have... Uh, among the world's strongest versions of the attorney-client uh, privilege. Now we've talked about the, uh, the attorney-client privilege and its relationship to the broader uh, duty of confidentiality. And we've talked about the rationale for that uh, privilege, the reason why we have it, even in, in its strong form in the United States, and part of the case against. And we see that played out in, a fa in the famous uh, you know, canonical case of uh, Robert Garrow's attorneys. Uh, we may be able to return to that case later uh, in the semester. Uh, but now that we've done that basic groundwork, uh, let's get a head start on the uh, preconditions uh, that one must establish before the privilege uh, attaches. And so one of those uh, is number four, as we see on the slide here, and that is that the client has to be obtaining legal assistance, not, you know, business advice, not, you know, personal column, you know, advice column type advice, but legal assistance. Now, sometimes that's, it's difficult to know where does, where does the line between legal assistance bleed over into, you know, other kinds of assistance. When, when do we know we've got which kind? Uh, but it does have to be uh, legal assistance, at least that's our, uh, that's our starting point. Uh, the uh, federal court, the Second Circuit, uh, took up this question in the case in Ray County of Erie. 
in this Second Circuit case, you've got some uh, arrestees who are uh, held in the Erie County Jail. And they object because there's a universal policy of strip search for everybody coming into the jail, regardless of what, you know, what was the basis for their arrest and how long they're staying. And they say, you know, you ought to fine tune this thing and not force everybody to go through a uh, strip search. So they bring a Section 1983 lawsuit in federal court. Fascinating topic. Uh, but I won't get into the merits of the case. This is just a discovery dispute where the plaintiffs say, we want to be able to look at the emails going back and forth between the attorneys who work for the county and the various people who are in charge of running and setting policy for the jail. The government objects and says, wait, um, we don't want to turn this over because it involves uh, privileged communications between you know, attorney and client. Uh, the magistrate uh, below, as well as the district court who affirms this decision, ordered discovery saying, no, what the attorneys were talking about, you know, went well beyond legal advice and it went into policy advice. And so it doesn't fall within the scope of the privilege. Uh, but the Second Circuit on, uh, on appeal uh, issued a mandamus and said that the content here of these emails could be privileged because policy advice could be legal advice, particularly if it's coming from an attorney who's being consulted about how to make policy comply with law. So the court says, the Second Circuit says, so long as the predominant purpose of the communication between lawyer and client is legal advice, then those other policy considerations or business considerations are not, quote, severable. Uh, the Second Circuit then remands uh, to determine uh, for the lower court to determine if the distribution of the email amounted to a waiver uh, of the attorney-client privilege by disclosing it to people other than, you know, representatives of the client or the attorney. And finally, one additional precondition for asserting the privilege, it's got to be information that comes to the attorney through a communication. Uh, so in question four, which is on page 309 of the casebook, we have an attorney who represents a plaintiff in a tort action. The plaintiff is in a body cast, but the attorney's out skiing one day and sees the client swooshing by, no body cast, out on the slope, seems to be doing perfectly fine. Uh, and then uh, is uh, served with process that would require the attorney uh, to deliver that information to, uh, to the court. This is a, quote, lawful demand for information. And so uh, it is uh, not going to fall within the privilege because you, you didn't learn about the, the fake nature of the uh, body cast by the client saying so in the attorney's office, just learned by happening to notice it out on the ski slopes. It didn't happen through a communication. So no privilege there, and therefore it would not be protected from a lawful demand for information. So that covers uh, this introductory unit, and we'll uh, move on into more of the details now about the uh, operation of the attorney-client privilege when we meet again next time.